Ladies and gentlemen, my special guest today via the telephone, Justin Wells. How's it going today, brother? Doing good, Elijah. How you doing, man? Doing good, man. Doing good. A little bit cold, but nothing three cups of coffee can't fix. So I'm warm, and I also feel like I'm on crack. So I'm doing pretty good today, man. I have this uh, coffee abuse problem uh, that I've inherited from my father that uh, (laughs) makes things a little squirrely sometimes. Yeah, but, but see, like I'm like the wolf on Pulp Fiction. When it comes to coffee, it's lots of cream, lots of sugar. Oh, no, man. Mine's, mine's black as my heart. Shh, buddy, I can't do it. To me, to be honest, man, it just tastes like burnt water. But I guess it just depends on the type of coffee <laughs> I mean, is, you get, right? I guess. I guess it does. I mean, I don't know. It's an acquired, you know. Like bourbon was back in the day for me, uh, it's an acquired thing. <laughs> yeah, man, everybody has what floats their boat, but it's good to talk with you today, man. How's 2022 treating you so far? You as well, man. Uh, 2022 has been interesting. We've had some weather. Um, I think shows are still kind of on the fence. We've not had any cancellations. We've not had any illness. Uh, but, uh, you know... Things are still, I think things are still finding their bearing. Mm -hmm. Um, As it turns out, I have no other marketable skills. So this is what I'm going to be doing as long as there's an industry to do it in. Yeah, and I'm glad that there still is. I know that it's, it it was really scary there for a little while. And we had to have the Save Our Stages Act and everything that was going on. But it feels good, man, to see all these shows and especially festivals popping up like there's so many festivals going to be going on this year and man that's good to see kind of getting that sense of normalcy back yeah i think people want it and need it i mean putting any sort of jokes aside music's gonna be around period i mean that doesn't necessarily mean robots won't be making it for us but um you know folks need it you know there's a reason there's music in the elevator when you get on it yeah, exactly, man. I was having a, a discussion with uh, Harry Clark of the Wooks a few weeks ago, and me and him got on this interesting topic of the thought, can music be genetic? And I think that it can be, man. If you look at a, like a young kid, you know, just a few months old, if you turn on the right song, they'll start hopping up and down and waving their arms, kind of like they're dancing, but... They don't know what music is. They don't even know what sound is. Yet, they're still dancing, man. It's kind of weird how music is almost in our DNA nowadays, it seems like. Well, I, yeah, I think we have kind of any number of instances of, you know, evidence to that. I don't know if it's exactly what you're speaking to, but, I mean, look at all the talent in the Jacksons. Look at the Staples Singers. Look at, you know, any number of family bands or, you know, Look at the Williams clan. There's like four, you know, senior and then junior, and uh, there's a four now. I mean, I think it's absolutely genetic, but I don't think it's just in the quote-unquote talented people. You know, I, I think this is maybe more along the lines of what you're speaking to. Um, it's in us to respond. We all have a, a literal beat in the middle of our body. You know? Yeah. That's pretty cool to think about. Yeah, man. It's weird. And, you know, I've always wondered why I like bluegrass so much, but maybe it's because, you know, like my great great grandpa liked bluegrass, you know? And maybe years sure. from now, our great great grandchildren will hear a Snoop Dogg song and start tapping their foot, <laughs> you know? Like, who knows what, what it's going to be like, man? But, you know, music's a, a beautiful thing, and I've really been enjoying your stuff. I got turned on to uh, your music back in December when I heard your cover of Blue Moon of Kentucky, and man, you absolutely killed that in a very cool way to uh, raise money for all the folks out there in Western Kentucky. But I was curious, you know, with there being so many great songs about the Bluegrass State, what made you go with that song in particular? Uh, because I knew it. And because um, you you know you said that you're a big fan of bluegrass, you're from you, you're from Pikeville. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there you go. It's in all y'all's DNA out there, man. Um, but uh, I think that you know what drew me to you know I grew up as kind of like a hard rock metal kid in Harrison County, Kentucky, 
Um, and I loved at that age anyway, playing real fast. And dude, that's what got me on the bluegrass, right? So my old band, I was in a band called Fifth on the Floor, and we would sometimes throw Blue Moon of Kentucky into another song of ours that was uh, at least our attempt at bluegrass being a bunch of long hair, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so that song, you know, has certainly been around uh, me for a while. But I think that sometimes when things are moving that quickly in music, you can you can miss um, you can miss some nuance, and that's certainly no criticism of bluegrass or metal or Jesus, certainly not Bill Monroe. But um, I guess what I'm trying to say is I <laughs> I move a little slowly, and uh, that's how I communicate, and that's how I thought we could communicate that song, and especially linked to um, the tornado. And, you know, that devastation down in western Kentucky that's not going to stop. I mean, the news cycles have already stopped about it. That, that, those families are affected, some of them, for a lifetime. Yeah. You know, I don't know. It, it seemed to me I'm not trying to give anything I did any sort of fake gravitas, but um, somber. Mm. Somber seemed like, like the right move. Yeah, man. And, and it's beautiful how everybody came together. I've always told folks that's why I'm so thankful to live in this state. Whenever these unfortunate tragedies happen, you have everybody getting together and doing what we can, man. We're we're lucky to have such great people in this bluegrass state. Yeah. I think that um, I've thought about this a lot. I'm not originally from Kentucky. I'm originally from Louisiana, and I moved up here when I was about 12 years old. Um, so I claim Kentucky. I'm a Kentuckian, um, but I'm not, you know, I'm not from the holler. Uh, I didn't come up, you know, my people didn't mine or anything like that. Um, and, yeah, super drawn to Kentucky. But Kentucky seems to me, you know, I, I almost feel inappropriate to comment on it, uh, not being kind of from here originally, but it seems to me almost like a, I don't know. It's like a geographical melting pot, right? Like, yeah. you know, people talk a lot about the North and the South and Kentucky's right on the cusp of that. And it's not, not the identity is not necessarily steeped in either. You know, people would probably argue with me over that. Um, but I mean, you know, bluegrass being from here, uh, all the center and around, <laughs> you know, horse racing and, tobacco things of this nature i don't know there's just a lot of reasons to have identity and you know i think plenty of other states have it as well i don't, I don't know i'm kind of circling and circling circling around my point but I, I think that a lot of ideologies end up here and it seems like it uh neutralizes kind of the what am i trying to say nicely the the more offensive things i think that people in kentucky are for the most part laid back and uh, yeah. have their mind on things that matter. Yeah, I get exactly what you're saying, man. See, I bounced around a lot as a kid. I was originally born in Richlands, Virginia, but I left there whenever I was six years old, uh, moved to Georgia for quite some time, and uh, moved to Kentucky whenever I was 13. So I'm not an original Kentuckian either, but the thing is about this state is if you stay in it long enough, you know, people will accept you as one of their own man and and that's not a thing that you really get other places especially in big places like new york or chicago or something like that those are the type of places where you basically have to be born there to be accepted as one of them but kentucky and buddy it, once you pass that 10 year mark i think it is that, that, <laughs> that, that they they accept you man and it's, it's, it's a big melting pot. That's one thing that I've always loved about this state, too, is I know that it's really known for its bluegrass and country, but nowadays you're seeing a great hip-hop artist come out of here. We've had plenty of great rock groups come out of this state as well. Yeah. It's a big entertainment melting pot. I, yeah, I think you're right, man. I think it's because, I don't know, maybe this is like my... Maybe I'm projecting this onto Kentucky, but I just, I do feel like, and especially the people that are natives and the people that I've spent time with, I don't know. They don't, they don't get caught up in some silliness. Uh, 
Yeah, I need to probably refine that thought before speaking to it further. I get what you're saying, man. It does make sense. But going back to your music, you seem like a guy that really likes to think whenever it comes to uh, <laughs> your your lyrics and your artwork and stuff like that. It kind of it seems like it has a lot of uh, deep meaning in the roots. And I really appreciate about that that as an artist because the art that you project kind of makes other people think too and they find uh, th- their own meanings behind either lyrics or artwork or whatever have you. And I really dug the artwork for your latest album, The United State. To me, it kind of gives off of the right vibe as to what a listener can expect before sitting down and listening to the album. But whenever it comes to that artwork, what was the thought process behind that cover? What exactly is the meaning there? Uh, The meaning is life. I mean, that album is life. And I didn't mean to laugh at your compliment earlier. Oh, no, you're fine. You're fine. I I laughed in in lieu of kind of trailing off on the previous question. Uh, But, you know... In that woman Maria's face, you see, I think, so much life. I mean, that's one of the most uh, that's one of the most beautiful shots I've seen in terms of you know showing some living. Um, that was a big part of it. I, I very literally see my mamma in her, um, but also, also, that's a deeply human cover and picture and photo and uh that was my whole intent behind the album is i think that there are a number of resources being pumped in maybe intentionally maybe not but things are being dehumanized you know we were joking about this before we started this interview about you know the <laughs> the node points we've put between my voice and yours and, and some of that is just rolling with the punches, right? During the pandemic, we got to work. We got to figure out what we're doing. Um, but I still think this bombardment of, you know, little ticker in the corner news cycles telling us what to think, et cetera, wherever you fall on any sort of interest in the news, you have to understand that that is chipping away at your humanity. And I don't think that I'm being overly lofty saying that. And I feel the same way about a lot of the things that I partake in, you know what I mean? Social Mm -hmm. media, et cetera. Uh, Not saying some little rinky dink album from Lexington, Kentucky has any sort of answers. All it is to me was speaking at um, the core of us. Uh, And, you know, obviously I've only got my own experiences and I can write as best I can about others. But the idea was to write about, um, you know, a life from birth to death and some of the, some of the the boons and and um, the happy spots throughout, right? Like finding true love, finding what you think is true love, then finding the real thing, finding, uh, in my case, finding my children, you know, having mm-hmm. two little girls that changed everything. So I don't know. It's probably, you know, I like to think of that record as country music as a concept. I've, I always feel like I'm sort of like a redheaded stepchild in both the Kentucky music scene and just country in general. Again, not coming from that. Um, but I treated this as, you know, country music and all roots music to me is about that, right? Like about living, about um, reduced to its core. And so th- that's what this album is, is country music, if anything, as a theme. Hmm. I dig that, man. And you can, I, I appreciate when an artist is keeping it real. You know, whenever you're listening to the lyrics, you can tell that they're not going for a hit. They're just saying it how it is. They're taking their life and their experiences and putting them out there for folks to relate to. And I, I like how you use the term humanity in your music because I think that whenever you find really good country music that's what you get is a good look at humanity whenever you're watching the news and stuff like that it can make you feel like the world is this big dangerous place filled with all of these evil people but real good country music is like real life 
people yeah. aren't as bad as every as the news and all these other media organizations put it out to be. The world isn't this bad place. There's still a lot of good out there. And if you uh, go out there and look for it, you're going to find it. Yeah, I would even say in addition to that, uh, people aren't as bad as they're depicted. People are also not as good. And also that would not be interesting. That would be like a, a Sunday morning comic strip right in the in the newspaper you know where the characters are two-dimensional but uh i feel like <laughs> real humans are infinitely more interesting and you you spend I, you know i don't know how long we're going to speak today but you spend 30 minutes talking to anybody and you're going to have i don't know i don't think you can just easily shove them in the good or bad corner there's more to it oh yeah my- and that's interesting yeah, m- most definitely. But whenever it comes to uh, this world, I-, I just would like to think that uh, whenever it comes to percentages, I would say that we're still above the 50% whenever it comes to good. And if you want the good in life, you got to. F- I always like to use the same with people. If you stand next to fire, you're going to get burned. It really just depends on what you surround yourself with and the people, the environment, the music, even the, the movies and stuff that you watch, the video games yeah. that you play. Like, that's uh, one reason why I quit playing Grand Theft Auto is, like, I just, I don't know, it it was kind of giving me, like, a bad feeling after a while. I'm like, I don't feel good about the stuff I'm doing in this game. And I feel ten times better whenever I'm putting on an album like yours and just going for a walk in the middle of the woods. It's all about, you know, finding what makes you feel good and holding on to it. I think you're right. I think you just said it right there, whatever that thing is. You know, grilled cheese and, and tomato soup, but <laughs> Yeah, man. Find that thing and hold on to it, you know? And I got to say, dude, your uh, music videos are put together very well, too. I think that it does a good job at kind of uh, taking its own interpretations behind your songs and bringing that message to a visual. But where do you and your crew begin on trying to get those right visuals for the songs, really getting that message across the way that you think in your mind it is? Man, I've been, you know, I I always try to avoid that blessed word. I feel like it's overused, but I've been blessed from, from day one playing music to always be surrounded by people more talented than me. Um, And in a lot of cases, we start with, so in my more, most recent videos that I do with a guy named Casey Pierce out of Nashville, he's done most of my videos in my solo career with a couple of exceptions. Um, but usually I'll tell him what the core of the song is, what the song is to me, uh, which I never want to be, you know, translated literally to the viewer or the listener. You know, I, I'm a big fan of finding what you want there. Um, I think that's part of the reason why I don't necessarily tell uh, front to back stories in a lot of my songs. I like the idea of, you know, you, Elijah, projecting your own experiences onto my work or whatever. Um, But usually it starts there. And then Casey is wonderful in that that's how he works anyway. So it kind of wouldn't matter if I wanted him to make a literal music video, you know, say that's just visually telling the story I'm already telling. He wouldn't do it anyway. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, there's some back and forth kind of as the thing's being born before it starts to take shape. Um, take, for instance, my song, No Time for a Broken Heart. He hits me up. We, I think we shot down a couple ideas, and he's like, all right, I'm picturing you in a suit. And I'm like, nah, <laughs> nah, we ain't doing that. And he said, uh, all right, yeah, but hear me out, dude. You, you, you a fan of Jungle Book? I was like, dude, Jungle Book's one of the best Disney movies of all time. And he said, picture you're Baloo and the kid is Mowgli. The kid, you're the, the office, uh, whatever it be, the secretary or the you know intern is Mowgli. And I'm like, all right, I'm, I'm with you. So that's the whole vibe of that. You know, that song is about telling somebody who's young and dumb that it's okay to be young and dumb, you know. Yeah, man, and that's my favorite song off that record, too. I, I've been wearing that record out for the past few months, man. And I always Wear like to out. ask uh, musicians that I listen to this question. I always like the response. You know, I'm like I said, I listen to you, but what are you listening to right now? Like, what's on your playlist, man? I really like uh, S.G. Goodman. She's from Western Kentucky, and I got hit to her. We did a thing together in Americana Fest. 
And uh, she's simply amazing. Um, Jim James produced her record, which doesn't surprise me. I'm a big fan of him. Uh, but her band was, uh, I don't know. I feel like it's, um, I don't know if she would take this as a compliment, but I feel like it's a noisy look at Kentucky music. And that's very much my vibe. Um, that I've, I've, <laughs> I've been recently listening to Bruno Mars and that's come from that Silk Sonics, right? You know, I've known Bruno Mars' work. I, you know, I watched the Super Bowl, but, uh, that's Silk Sonics record, man. Come on. Oh, That's dude, like it's so good, man. And, and Bootsy Collins being the host. I <laughs> yeah. mean, you, you couldn't have hey, found a baby. better person to host it. Bootsy, baby. Yeah. Dude. yeah. Bootsy, baby. <laughs> Those guys just, uh, I don't know, man. Like, sometimes something just gets made, and you're like, that's not, those people aren't human. Those people are from another earth. Um, you know, subsequently, I think Spotify's been feeding me, like, Bruno Mars singles. I'm like, dude, this dude's just nonstop. Um, yeah, all over the place, dude. All over the place. A lot of podcasts. Uh, you name it. <laughs> That's It's cool because you... Like, I wouldn't think of you to be a Bruno Mars fan, but I think that it's cool for artists to get inspiration from all over the place. And, like, how you said you're from Louisiana earlier. Do you think that, like, there's some type of influence that's in your music today? Well, uh, you know, I, I'm a fan of music. I don't, I don't even really care. I mean, like, when I used to travel a lot by myself, kind of, post my band breaking up my old band and then you know forming a new one i was touring just with an acoustic guitar there for a couple of years and uh you know i had my satellite radio and I, I would almost leave it on 40s junction which is like the andrew sisters and bing crosby and all this mess in it and you know it's all this kind of like wartime you know 40s jazz but it's all like unbelievably like sickeningly like sweet and positive but it's there's something underlying that i found in that music that is actually creepy. Even though they're singing, like, it's all very bubblegum in a way. You know, I mean, think of the time, right? You're not going to say anything controversial in music at that time. Um, but something about that was almost, like, alarmingly uh, ominous <laughs> is mm -hmm. the best way I could describe it. And I love that. I love just finding the own things that might not even be there. As far as being from Louisiana, I don't know, man. I have a deep tie to the South in a in a maybe an interesting way, you know, um, uh, I don't, I'm tied to the cultural South. I don't really care so much about location. I think because, I, and I wonder if you're this way as well, because I moved around so much, I think if I'd have, uh, just stayed in one place my whole life, maybe I would, um, I don't know, cheer for the team, et cetera. I'm more interested in like, yeah, the arts coming out of these places and the, <laughs> the food coming out of these places, how that applies to, um, like, it, it, if you're asking if there's anything Southern in my music, I, I think it's pretty, like, distinctly Southern uh, in that I think that the South is, in a lot of ways, the birth of what we know as American music, you know? I think that's where, you know, the jazz and the blues and everything's from. Rock and roll's from the South, in my heart, Um so in as much as any of us, I don't know. I think that I kind of dodged your answer, but. No, man, no, you, you, you uh, hit the nail on the head there. You know, it's, I, I appreciate bouncing around a lot, and it did give me this wide musical taste, but it also made me very weird, too, because I, I can go from Toby Keith to, you know, Black Label Society to Billy Strings, the Almond Brothers, you know, jazz. Like right now, I'm on this 70s Japanese jazz kick because I'm that far down music rabbit holes. But I'm one of those people I can literally listen to everything, and that makes easy road trips with me. I think that if you just listen to one style of music, it would be boring. I don't see how people can do that, man. Well, uh, one of my guys on my management team, uh, he's he's insisting that genre is dead. And he's probably right. I mean, yeah. definitely in as much as anybody that, you know, Spotify is kind of your primary portal to what you listen to. It probably is dead. And I'm sure there are purists who would poo-poo that and, and don't want that to happen. I, I'm pretty uninterested. As somebody who I don't feel like is clearly in a specific genre, I don't really care. You know, there's going to be people who keep themes and traditions alive in music and 
and those people are necessary and great. And then there's going to be other people who um, just do their own thing for better, for worse. And, and those things are necessary and that's great. Yeah, man. And I also love how, you know, there's this music kind of like a revolving door. Every few years, it seems like history repeats itself. Going back to that Silk Sonic record with Bruno Mars and Anderson Pack, I would have never thought to hear Bootsy Collins be hosting an album here in 2022, but I dig it. And now with uh, Billy Strings bringing, bringing bluegrass back, who knows what the future is going to be like, man, but it's pretty exciting. So whenever it comes to, uh, you know, getting a little bit of popularity as an entertainer, it's cool for me to get recognized at Walmart once every five years or so, but I've seen on your Facebook, <laughs> man, where fans are actually getting tattoos that are inspired by your music, and I would say that that's so crazy to wrap your mind around. What's some of your favorite ink that, from fans that have uh, kind of stood out to you? Oh, I don't know, man. I, I, I'm not going to say because I wouldn't want to uh, offend anybody. There, there was one in particular that I thought was really cool. I had a lady... Asked me, she gave me her mail address. Um, asked me to to sign. No, not sign it. I don't think I signed it. Maybe she just asked for a smiley face. Maybe she got a piece of merch. Whatever it was, I had to draw a smiley face, right? Mm-hmm. And I mean, I'm no Jesus. I'm no. Uh, <laughs> I'm no uh, physical artist. You know, I I drew a smiley face that looks like a toddler did it. I'm I'm positive my nine year old children could do it. Um, better <laughs> and I sent it back to her or whatever and then that fan came up to me at a show months later and she'd gotten that smiley face tattooed on her and it said going down grinning um, wow. and it wasn't a I don't know I'm not trying to it, it wasn't like a yeehaw it wasn't you know it wasn't like yeah it was more like your song has got me through a lot that's the kind of thing that just there ain't a lot of things that can shut my loud mouth up, but that one, you know, that kind of thing. Anytime people come up and have something sincere to say, mm-hmm. you know, when I when I create this music, I'm I'm sitting down a sincere way, and I I disarm some of these heavier songs by, you know, trying to get a laugh on stage. But I, they start from sincere places, and anytime I can connect with somebody like that, dude, I I don't even care if my bills are paid. You know what I mean? Like that's the that's the jam right there. Yeah, man, that, that's what makes music such a beautiful thing in the first place, is it gives people somebody to relate to. Like, I've been through things in my life that I thought were only happening to me. And then you find this one artist that just hits the nail on the head and is saying exactly what you're thinking. And I'd say that that's pretty cool that you uh, know that your music is having that effect on people, especially with the tattoo, man. What was the first, do you remember the first tattoo that somebody ever got of your music? And what was going through your mind? (laughs) I do. I actually do. And this is kind of funny. Uh, So I was in a band called Fifth on the Floor for about nine years and, um, we banged around the country, you know, I'm not going to date myself, but, uh, the band's been gone for a while, but, uh, there was a guy that we used to, you know, he was just in the Lexington bars. We were off, you know, the band formed in Lexington and, uh, there was this dude, you know, every band, every artist needs them. But if you're, especially heaven help you, if you're starting out like we did completely independent. So you're playing in <laughs> bars, for a bunch of drunks making no money, you know, kind of thing. And this dude was at every show, right? White guy, redhead, uh, with dreads, he had redhead dreads. And he went and by his Spanish nickname from high school. He's not Spanish at all. This is, you know, you take a Spanish <laughs> class, they give you a Spanish name. So he went by his Spanish name, his name's Pepe. That's why I underline these white. This dude is the whitest, uh, Super with, sweet guy. With you know, red dreadlocks, like man. This guy sounds red like dread. a character, dude. Oh, right, buddy, you don't even know, dude. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, and just, just wow. But, uh, come to every show, big old fan, right? And he tells me one day, he said, Justin, I'm going to get me a fifth on the floor tattoo. And I said, well, I just could not support that more, sir. And, uh, I said, what are you going to get? He said, I'm just going to get, get your logo right here on my forearm. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, uh, if you're going to get that tattoo, we'll pay for it. 
you go to my artist, we'll pay for it, and you got free admission uh, to every fifth on the floor show you ever want to go to for the rest of your life. And he goes, deal. So we go do it. My pal Chris Rogers did it. And uh, that dude got into every, you know, as we started to, you know, actually sell tickets and be worth tickets and have some bit of a claim, he still got in free. And then the band broke up and uh, I started putting on solo shows. He goes, Justin, uh, does this get me into Justin Well show? <laughs> <laughs> I, I was going to ask that. Does it? Uh, you know, it's gotten him into a couple. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, 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 the guy deserves it. Where did he get the tattoo at? Like, like on his body? <laughs> oh, like on his forearm. So, like, very visible. <laughs> wow. You know? Yeah, I was, I was going to say, if it's yeah, a very visual, yeah. visual tattoo, then yeah, man, I, I could say he gets a ticket. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's, you know, we'll, we'll make that back in ad dollars, right? <laughs> that's wild, man. But uh, you know, the worst part is it. It was like our first logo. It wasn't a very good logo, you know. <laughs> Well, if he could have waited a couple of years, we'd have given him a better one. I don't think that Pepe cares too much about a lot of the choices that he makes from the person that he sounds like. But he sounds like a very interesting, cool individual that I would love to hang out in a bar with. You want to hang out in a bar? Yeah, I don't know. You want to <laughs> make sure you're a safe distance. <laughs> 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 but uh, uh, but earlier, man, we were talking about music uh, making a comeback. And, you know, I know vinyl has made a really big comeback here lately. I'm a big, I, I've got a big vinyl addiction. Very, this cost me a lot of money that my wife isn't too happy okay. about. But I've seen where you sell vinyl and also see where you sell cassettes, too. And I thought that that was cool. You don't see a lot of those. And I'm old school, man. I'll pop a tape in every once in a while. What's one of your favorite yeah. formats to listen to music? music on well it's definitely vinyl but i don't know if, if i'm being 100 percent honest uh vinyl you know is my is my favorite way to listen to it but I, I don't think i care as much as i thought i did and more importantly you know i think my favorite time to listen to music is in the car while traveling especially if i'm by myself so obviously that nicks is vinyl I, I don't I don't know. I mean the real answer is just live, you know, from the creators. But um yeah, I don't know. And you know, interesting that you bring this up because I've been doing a lot of thinking about this. I personally as a musician am stoked that vinyl has made a comeback and I personally just hate CDs, like not even sonically. CDs sound great, whatever. You know, people that poo poo on that are kind of silly, but uh, I just don't like them. I don't like CDs like in my hand. I don't like them banging around my car. You know, you remember that. I mean, oh, I don't yeah. know how old you are, but like, yeah, dude, I had a, you know, I, I remember I thought I was rad because I had like a six disc changer, like a hundred dollar, like <laughs> paper. six disc changer, but it was in the trunk. So I had all my CDs in the trunk, dude. You had to like stop the car, or change the CD or whatever. Um, I hate that. I hate that. Uh, I'll take Spotify and an auxiliary cord any day at this point, but um, speaking to the vinyl thing coming back, uh, you know, these shortages and everything that's slowing down, um, we're about to start making another record. And I, I fear hearing what the turnaround times are because in the best of times, they were about six or seven months for me, you know, me not being Jack White. Uh, so I, I can't imagine what they are now. So it seems like that the new way is to release an album and people order the vinyl and they get the vinyl whenever the vinyl comes and that you know by the time the vinyl comes you might have another record out you know yeah man but but it sounds so good i you can't explain it to people that don't get it either either you love vinyl or you just don't get it but man there's something about that cracking and that popping it just and also like looking at the record itself it's almost like you're reading a book whenever you're listening to the album one of my favorite things is like going into a used store and seeing some of the writing on it and just thinking you know who had this before like how many hands did it change to get to my hands where it's now going to have its forever home and it's cool that you bring up jack white too because there's also interesting things happening with vinyl nowadays like how you're doing the uh the colored vinyl the the green and blue my favorite's the green by the way, but did you see yeah. where uh, Jack White done the holograms on the vinyl? Oh yeah, I got it on the shelf over here. <laughs> oh, I'm jealous, I man. 
Yeah, I lo- you know, I love all that kind of stuff. You, if you go looking through my art and stuff, you know, there's little little winks or whatever you want to call it, Easter eggs uh, throughout it. You know, I was a Pink Floyd kid growing up. I always loved, I don't know, every inch of a physical copy of a record is a chance to be creative for me, to the spine. You know, like why, why spend all this time making a um, an album, sonically? Mm-hmm. And then, and then just not care about the the packaging or something. Just slap a photo on there and you're done. Man, no, dude, you got you got inches and inches to cover. So yeah, I love it. But you're and you're talking too. Again, I think we're kind of in a way circling back to the beginning of this conversation with what we're talking about is analog. We're talking about humanity. We're talking about like feeling something real as opposed to you know, through the airways or what have you. I think people are longing for that. And uh, I don't know, I'm no sociologist, but that's probably speaking to um, some sort of rejection of a lot of where we're at. And, you know, speaking about artwork and stuff like that, I love the artwork of Jimbo Valentine. Jimbo, not only is he a great artist, but he's also one of the nicest, most humble human beings on planet Earth. I love that dude. And I think that some of his best work is on your posters, man. Do you have a favorite Jimbo concert flyer that he's designed for you? I, well, it's funny. I've got like three new ones in my inbox that I need to look at right now. Uh, he just emailed me. But, um, dude, I do have a favorite. And it's maybe not what you would think. Uh, it's an old one. And actually, uh, my pal Parsons, who played in Fifth on the Floor with me and, and who is now playing um, with me in my band, I mean, just recently, just started back. Uh, he's got this. Okay, so there's the V Club in Huntington, which is now called The Loud. And they have these uh, big frames outside, not in like, like, a, like an old mutiny, like a movie theater. But these frames are even bigger. So they, I, I can't even reckon with the dimensions but they'd be t- as tall as like the door to your house some of these flyers wow. and they would you know they would have their regular size flyers but then they would blow up like say three of them for like i don't know i don't know if it's even necessarily important shows maybe it's just shows that they wanted to promote more and it's right there you know in the middle of town or whatever you'd see these big posters parsons uh who i mentioned he's got that big poster of the show I'm about to describe, but the show is Fifth on the Floor, my band, a band called Small Batch that uh, not a lot of people know Tyler Childers sang in for a time and was at that time, and uh, and a band called Prison Book Club, which was John R. Miller's band. So it was uh, the three of us in our old incarnations, and it was a Jimbo flyer, and I love it. I've got a little bitty version, but <laughs> Parsons has the big mama. That's cool, man. I wish that more people knew about him, and I'm glad that he's gaining the traction that he is because, man, his artwork, it's some of the best artwork that I've ever seen come out of the mountains. It's weird, and it's cool. It makes you think, but I don't have any idea as to how to describe his artwork to people. I had him on the podcast a few months ago, and uh, I was talking to my wife about him. She's like, so what's it like? And I'm like... I have no idea how to even begin to describe <laughs> what Jimbo Valentine is like, but oh, that dude, he knocks it out of the park every single time. I've never seen a bad piece of art from him. No, it's like, yeah, I'm with you. I don't know how I would describe it either. It, it's you, you, you might start with saying that it's dark, but that's not quite correct because it's almost like it takes dark themes and makes them a little more um appealing to the masses it's certainly not necessarily uh you know like metal uh flyers although i bet he would crush that but it is uh it is bizarre and perhaps most importantly uh, distinctly jimbo you know i know what his style is we all know what his style is and um you know he was (laughs) i don't think he even knows this but he was kind of like a myth to me uh super early on we're talking about you know, around that fifth on the floor time, um, playing at the V Club, he'd done several posters and flyer sports, and we always loved going there because they made their own flyers. We didn't have to make them, and they were super rad. We'd take a bunch of them. But I don't know that he came to those shows for a while, or if he did, he sat in a corner, which is possible. Uh, so I didn't meet him for a long time. I was familiar with his work on my band, 
long before I met him. Yeah, he, he's a very mysterious guy, but I like that about him, too, because it I, I think that that kind of fits his style good. And, you know, you can really tell whenever it's his artwork, too. If I just see a poster and I don't even have to read the description, I'm like, yeah, that that's Jimbo. It's kind of like an ACDC song. Whenever you hear those first three <laughs> licks, you know it's ACDC. Jimbo Valentine yeah. is the ACDC of mountain art. Yes, sir. There you go. But, I, I don't think you can beat that description. Yeah, man. <laughs> you might need to offer that up to you. Yeah, I'll give him a call here after me and you talk. <laughs> but I'm looking okay, forward to new, uh, what the new year has for you, though, man. What's uh, 2022 going to be like for Justin Wells? I don't know. Uh, we're about to record something, and I don't know if it is. Uh, <laughs> it's a little bit like when we found out my wife was pregnant, uh, we found out that there were two heartbeats in there and had twins so um might just have twins this year not sure cool man cool but thank you so much for your time today brother i I really enjoyed this conversation man and i've really been enjoying your music too so for people that want to uh check it out where do they go to do that it'll be justinwellsmusic.com and uh Every single platform that you like, including cassette, as you as you mentioned. All right, there we go, man. Well, Justin, thank you again for your time, brother. I wish nothing but the best of a new year for you, and I hope to catch a show out there one day, man. I'm looking forward to it. Liza, thanks for all the, the kindness, and thanks for the time, and sorry we bumped this from earlier. Uh, this is a little better time for me. I appreciate you being, being malleable with that. Anytime, man. Anytime.